There's a million different ways to prospect people that could be labeled training. And people pay hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars for this training. And I'm not saying any of it's bad. I've used a ton of it. A lot of it works. You just got to find something that works for your own philosophy. What I want to introduce you to is a, if you will, trainingless approach to prospecting people that has two profound values, uh, at least from my point of view. One is you don't have to learn how to do it, which for me is a huge upside. You don't have to memorize scripts. You don't have to use um, calculated, manipulative questions. You don't have to color code people. You don't have to do any of that. And the second huge upside to it is it addresses the biggest challenge that we all have as network marketers. And that is we have two big challenges when it comes to prospecting people. One, they don't understand what it is we do, which is addressed my address for that is the four-year career. Or two, once they find out what we do, once they associate us with a company that they understand, like an Amway, they don't want to do it, right? And the reason for that is, if you look at the approaches that people have taken for the last 60 years, the prospecting recruiting approaches for most people is a desperate approach. People are afraid they're gonna fail. They're afraid they're gonna fail, so the way they look at every prospect is that person needs to be the person that makes it for them. So they get attached to each individual coming in the business. And they approach the conversation from a right or wrong standpoint. The word should comes into their pre presentation over and over and over again. You should be doing this. You should look at network marketing. You should be worried about your financial future. You should be an entrepreneur. You should join my company. You should use these products because what you're doing doesn't work and it's wrong. And how does that make you feel? If you were a prospect and I came to you and said, what you're doing for a career is wrong, your financial strategy for your life is wrong. You should be using my products and you should be in my network marketing MLM pyramid company. How does that, whether or not you agree with me or not, how does that approach make you feel? I think, you know, probably if we could put one word on it, it's dishonoring. It dishonors people's authenticity. It, it, it dishonors their individuality. It, it dishonors their intellect. It, it dishonors their emotional spirit because it doesn't allow them to be, doesn't allow them to be with esteem. Who they are and what they are is wrong. It's not enough. And they need to be doing something different. And that approach alienates people. So again, if you go watch a super MLM man, you'll see this in living color, where for some reason, we don't see it in the same way when we're in the soup, when we're prospecting as a distributor. We just don't get the same experience as the man on the street who's not prospecting them, but is asking them, how do you feel about those people that do network marketing? They don't feel good about us at all, which is a huge barrier to build a business, right? Over here, we have the most extraordinary wealth building financial opportunity ever conceived by mankind. We have the eighth wonder of the world. We have something where for a few thousand dollars and 10 or 15 hours a week and four or five years of doing the right things, you can become a multimillionaire. That's what we have over here. And for the most part, we have extraordinary products. Right? We have it. I mean, we have integrity in the product section. For the most part, most companies have extraordinary products. And over here, the marketplace that we need to manifest that doesn't like us. Doesn't like how we do business. They don't trust us. They don't want to be around us. They want to take a shower. They want to run from us. So, if you want to be part of the solution moving forward, it's kind of like, you know, you're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. So this approach leaves people in a really powerful place, whether they get involved in your opportunity or not. And I say this approach is much, much more effective at actually enrolling them.
and you have to trust it. It's counterintuitive. What is intuitive actually for most people is I got in, I need to get other people in, you need to get in my business, you should do what I'm doing. There's, what's intuitive, unfortunately, is desperation. And why I'm such a stand for us moving away from hype and moving into actually understanding the business model and being professionals with the business model is it tends to ease off the desperation and make us peaceful warriors. And peaceful warriors is what can heal our image in the public sector. So here's the approach. Just try it on. Maybe we'll even let you workshop it for a few minutes so you can feel it. So <clears throat> the distinction that defines this approach is curious. Now this has less application the more you know someone. So with family, not so much application, close friends, less application, casual friends, still lots of application, people you don't know, total application. The distinction that defines this approach to inviting is curious. And here's what I mean by curious. Who you will want to be to walk this path is curious about other people. So I want you to imagine in a conversation with another person. You're not yet in a conversation, but you're curious about them. This could be somebody that you have on Facebook. It could be somebody you're sitting next to on an airplane. It could be, you know, somebody that's in your casual circle of friends that you don't talk to that often. But I just want you to imagine that who you are relative to that person, any person, is curious. If you are curious, what form of communication will exist? So if you're curious, are you going to be telling them stuff? Doesn't match up, does it? If you're curious, are you going to be asking them questions? If you're curious, are your questions going to be pre-strategized and calculated? If you're curious, what is perhaps the first question you might ask somebody, assuming you don't know it already? that you just met. So I heard, what's your name? What do you do for a living? Where do you live? Those are three really simple ones, right? Now, if you're on an airplane, what you might ask is coming or going. But it's something, right? The most powerful one is, what's your name? People's names, is like music to their ears. They love hearing their names. They love telling people what their name is. And it's a simple, harmless question. What's your name? You ask somebody their name, the conversation has started. In my experience, the next safest and most compelling thing for people to want to answer is where they live. What you do for a living, pretty safe, easy to answer. Those are just three potential starters. But if you're deeply steeped in this distinction of being curious, you approach it the same way you would approach it if I gave you $500 to have a conversation with somebody and you're just curious, and I ask you, what are you going to say? What would the answer be? You don't know. And that's actually where I want you to come from if you're just curious. So when you ask yourself, well, what if I was curious, what, what's the first thing I would ask them? I want your answer to be, you don't know. And I want that to be okay with you. And so let's say that your first question is, what's your name? Then you might be asking, well, if they tell me their name, what might be the next question? And maybe it's okay, where do you live and where do you work? Wait, once you get past where you work, what do you think the fourth question might be if you're just curious? Okay, you might ask, how'd you get into that business? Do you enjoy what you do? Married, not married? How long have you lived there? What led you to move there? Where'd you live before that? There's about 150 questions you could ask. Past that, where I want you to be with this is, you don't know what you would ask next, and that's okay with you. Why? 
because your only job in this conversation is to be curious. If you're curious about me and you ask me a question and I'm answering the question, how would you be when I'm answering the question if you're curious about me? I'm answering the question. How would you be? Would you be thinking about the next strategic question to ask me to tip me into your business? No. If you're curious about me and you ask me a question, wouldn't it make sense that you were paying close attention to the answer? Why? Because you want to know, right? You're curious. Like if you ask me, why did I move there? You actually want to know why I moved there. So the process of this technique, if you will, is three basic steps. It is first to be totally curious, ask what I would call intuitive questions. An intuitive question is a question that you are just moved to ask and you don't second guess, you don't audit whether or not you ought to ask it. Like if you have the thought to ask it, it's already asked. And when somebody is answering you, you're paying total attention to the answer. Not just what they say, but this is something to practice be with them, like be with them in the answer and be open to receiving who they're being. So can you notice when you're talking to some people, they're answering a question and who they're being is, they don't want to answer this question. You notice that? Or who they're being is, they want to, they want to be something else, like they're, they want to be somewhere else, they don't have time to have this conversation. You want to be present to that. or. Who their being is, that's uncomfortable for me to answer, that's too personal. Or who their being is frustrated. Or who their being is excited. So if you're not thinking strategically about the next question to ask, if you're just being present, you can be present to who they're being. And if you're paying attention to what they're saying, but most importantly, who they're being, here's what I can promise you. You will have an endless flow of intuitive, authentic, natural questions to ask them. And what it will be based on is what they just said. So the next question is based on what they just said. Not something you thought of five minutes ago. Not even something you want to know about them. But based on what they just said. Simple as that. Curious, be present, be patient, ask intuitive questions. And here's what will happen. I will make you this solemn promise if you'll practice this art with people. They will open up their entire life to you. They will open themselves up to you like they haven't opened themselves up to somebody since they fell in love. Or since they were a child opening up to their parents. And they will open up to you this way because this is not how people communicate in our world. How people communicate in our world is they come into life into a mix of people. If I'm coming into a, into these you as a group of people, if I'm normal, how I'm coming into you is with a set of opinions and with an agenda. And my agenda when I meet somebody like you is I want to impress you. I want you to know stuff about me. I want you to like how I'm dressed. I want you to like how I'm look, how I look. If we get an opportunity for me to share any of my opinions, or my accomplishments in life, I want to get those on the table. If I'm human, my agenda is to be known, to be respected, and to be accepted. That's the human agenda. The problem with that agenda is we all have it. So we come together like this. These two agendas is, I am, it's actually an addiction. I am addicted to being known. I am addicted to being heard. I am addicted to being right. I am addicted to being respected. I am addicted to being accepted. I am addicted to you listening to me. It's a train wreck every time two people come together. And all you need is the tiniest bit of awareness 
about shifting that for you, the tiniest bit of awareness, that that's what it is to be human. And you can shift it. You can shift it. You shift it the tiniest bit. So who you are with people are curious and you ask intuitive questions and you're present to them and you're patient. They're going to open up their whole life to you. And what they're going to tell you is something they're deeply passionate about that they want more of in life. Or they're going to tell you something that's deeply painful in their life that they desperately need less of. And in most of those cases, you will be able to authentically say something like, I know exactly how you can solve that. Would that interest you enough just to look? Or something like that. Just ask people to look to solve a specific problem or to address a specific passion that they have declared is huge for them. So if you tell me in a conversation that your biggest challenge and passion in life is you have three kids who are entering college and you could be burdened with 25 to 50 grand a year per kid that's going to eat away at 30 years worth of retirement and you don't know how to handle that. And I say, I know exactly how you could handle it. Is that worth taking a look? What are you going to say to that? What people say no to is the shotgun blanket hype full of claims. My product, my company, my comp plan, my car program, my trips, my money. It's all about me. And the only time it's about you is what you can do for me. And people get that. So if you can imagine that we all went out in the world for the next 60 years. And the way we invited people to look at who we are and how we play the game of life and network marketing is through being present for people and being actually curious about them, authentically curious about them, and not asking calculated questions, but asking intuitive questions, and just letting them open up when, if and when they're ready to open up. Imagine if I prospect Joy a year from now and the last three people that she met in network marketing that she said no to addressed her that way. Imagine the opportunity I'll have for her. Like if I were a super MLM man and I interviewed her and I said, hey Joy, do you know anything about network marketing? She's likely to say, yeah. I do. How do you feel about it? I love those people. Imagine what we could do with our business model when most of the people that we're looking to involve actually trust us, admire us, and respect us. And from a four-year career standpoint, they actually understand the business model. They understand that most people are not going to succeed, but anyone can. And they understand from a wealth building standpoint, how it compares to real estate and equities is hard to compare the two. And they've been treated right. Imagine what people will be able to do five or 10 years from now in building an empire if most of the people that they talk to say network marketing, or, yeah, I get it. And you know what? The last few people I've talked to, really nice people. So uh, I'll, uh, tell you a story to like anchor this approach. This was a story that was written up in Psychology Today perhaps 30 years ago. And it is a, uh, a staged process to experience the impact that a curious, listening, present person has on somebody that's not used to that. And the staged experiment worked like this. The editor of Psychology Today got on an airplane in New York and flew nonstop to Los Angeles. And the project was whoever he sat next to, his project for five hours was just to be curious about his seatmate. Ask questions, 
If the seatmate asked him a question, which by the way is an important part of this process, somebody asks you a question, answer it, not with a riddle. You know, I have a really good, very successful friend in network marketing. People ask him what he does. He likes to tell him he's an emergency retirement specialist. <laughs> if I ask you what you do for a living, what do you think I want to know? This is not a riddle. If I ask you what you do for a living, what do you think I want to know? If I ask you where you live, what do you think I want to know? If I ask you what do you do for a living, do you think I want some kind of riddle? I want to know. And I want to like, no, no. So if you say, well, I'm in network marketing, do I know what you do for a living? No, 99% of people have no idea what that is. So you haven't answered my question, have you? If I ask you what you do for a living and you say, you know, I help people, uh, you know, have fun and retire and do I know what you do for a living? No, I know some silly riddle somebody taught you to say. Your elevator speech. If I ask you what you do for a living, I want to know what you do for a living. So if you're in network marketing and you're a Purium distributor, what do you do for a living? You could say it a thousand different ways, but how about think about saying it in a way where I don't have to ask twice. Now that's totally counter to 60 years worth of training in our profession. But it's the kind of answer that instills trust, admiration, and respect with people. Do you know what I've been telling people for about 20 years? People ask me what I do for a living. So I'm a network marketer. I know they don't know what that means, so I tell them what it means. Like Amway, Mary Kay, Herbalife, New Skin, companies like that. That's what I do for a living. And then I shut up. Now, do they jump all over me and want to join? No, but you know what it creates? It creates safety. It creates safety two ways. Number one, I told them the truth. There's nothing left for them to ask me about what I do. I told them the worst. I do like Amway. <laughs> but then I did something, I do something that I think is really important. I shut up. Because every other Amway distributor that ever been around or other network marketers, what do they do? They start talking. I shut up. They always ask. Kimmy and I just did it last night. We, we had this great couple coming back from Lanai, standing in line at the airport chatted up with them in line, we flew over here, we gave them a ride to their hotel, and we told them. They said, what do you do for a living? We just told them. And with the, the girl, it was great. You know, we saw progress. The girl, she says, in a positive way, she said, does something like, does that, does that actually work for you? Like that. <laughs> then she said it like that, which I saw as like a hugely positive sign. And I said, well, yeah, uh, let me tell you her story. And I just told her Kimmy's story. I mean, Kimmy's got a crush it story. 20,000 people in four years with no experience. $50,000 a month she peaked out at. So I just told the story and stepped back and it was pretty interesting. But I also told her we we're in the nutrition business. We're in network marketing. It's like Amway. It's like, I t the reason I throw those companies off, I don't want her to have any question about what we do. Most people, if you say network marketing, they think you're in some kind of computer thing or something. They don't know what that is. You better either rattle off a half a dozen companies that they know, or you better say pyramid scheme. Because <laughs> otherwise they don't know what you're talking about. So you know those pyramid schemes that people, yeah, well, I'm on top of one of those. <laughs> They like that answer. They go, really? <laughs> Tell me more about that. How does that work? Well, it's a very small pyramid scheme. I got started last week, but I am on top. <laughs> Building from here out. So let me finish the story. So they fly all the way to LA. The Psychology Today crew is in LA. They get off the plane. They go to the guy who was sitting next to the editor of Psychology Today. Now, the story claimed, I'm just telling you what the story said. The story claimed that in the five and a half hours, ironically, 
the person the editor was sitting next to was not very open and did not ask the editor of Psychology Today what he did for a living. The article said he didn't ask him his name. He didn't ask him anything, if hardly anything. So the point is, the seatmate knew nothing about the editor. The editor was curious for five and a half hours and present. And when he got off the plane, the crew went to the seatmate and said, hey, what'd you think about the guy you flew out here with? And this is exactly what the seatmate said. It's the most interesting man I've ever met. <laughs> So, the lesson in that story is, how effective do you think you could be at attracting people to your opportunity if you became the most interesting person they've ever met? <laughs>